it's the um, curious situation where the closer you get, the less you see. Thank you everyone for joining us today and welcome to the first of the uh, monthly Martin Gardner Celebration of Mind Talks. If you joined us last month, you know that we had a series of 21 talks spread out over a week around Martin Gardner's birthday, the 21st of October. Mm -hmm. So we've decided that going forward, uh, probably on the 21st of every month, we're going to do a special celebration of Mind Talk. And uh, today we're very pleased to kick this off with an interview with Ken Knowlton, who um, is a pioneer in computer graphics and best known for his digital mosaics. Those of you who have attended uh, Gathering for Gardner in the past have no doubt seen uh, probably a talk by him and his famous Martin Gardner uh, domino mosaic. And to lead the interview, we have uh, magician and inventor Mark Setter Ducati, who's also one of the founders of Gathering for Gardner, and um, Bob Bosch, who is a math professor at Oberlin College. I am going to hand it off now to Mark, who is going to have a slideshow. Hi, everybody. I'm Mark Sutter Ducati, and I'm really happy to be here uh, talking to Ken Knowlton. So this is the famous Martin Gardner piece that uh, Ken did. Let's see. The, the domino picture. Uh, and uh, Ken, uh, this you did in 1981. Is that correct? I don't remember. Oh, OK. Ken, uh, how did you first meet Martin Gardner or find out about Martin? I don't remember. It was uh, such an obvious thing. He's, a, he's interested in puzzles and principles of puzzles. And uh, I was involved in one kind of puzzle. And uh, it was obviously a, a good connection. Uh, and uh, you attended, I don't know if you were at the first gathering, but possibly the second. You were at several of the gathering for gardeners. Is that correct? Yes, I did. Yes, I was. Okay. Uh, there's a picture of a uh, younger Ken. Is that a picture that you created? Yes. Computer file that describes that. Uh, I didn't make the physical picture, but I defined it. So that's a, a, a computer picture that you yeah. created. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, you, you were grew up in New York State, and I hear it's a little bit of your early years. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll move on. Now, let's get to this right away. We'll get into some of the science. Here you are pictured at Bell Labs in uh, the early 60s, and the, picture, the person next to you is Leon Harmon, and he's the one at the time at Bell Labs uh, did this little uh, Lincoln picture that everybody is familiar with. That's the Lincoln picture that later became the Dolly picture. But the interesting thing is the picture in the background, the, uh, the reclining uh, lady picture, um, can you talk about that a little bit? What the significance of that picture was and do you have anything to say about that? I think it, it was the first picture of a nude uh, that was printed in the New York Times. Okay, but, but more, well, that, that's also an interesting story that I've heard, but, the, but what about technically the math? Was this the first time a photograph was scanned into a computer? and then broken up into grayscale images? Is that, what was the, the technical oh, part of it? Oh, we, we uh, Harmon and I did, did lots of stuff with it. Many people played with computers to make images of one some form or another. So this is uh, um, what the fine structure is, the, is what we can, what we invented, so to speak, uh, developed to use as a grayscale um, set of stamps to make uh, large pictures that are visible best as a single picture if you see it from far enough away. So, and, uh, and I think it was the first time that a nude was printed in the New York Times. Now you did this picture as a joke, is that correct? It wasn't meant to be a serious picture. Your, your boss at the time uh, was on vacation, from what I remember, and uh, then you artists. Did. We, it wasn't a joke. This is a real. I know it was a real, I real, but but you, you put it on his office wall. The picture is real, obviously, but you put it on his on his wall. Yes, and, yes, yes. Right, and then when he came back, uh, 
I think he told you to uh, take it down and uh, not to use Bell Labs name on it. But then later when it, when it appeared in the New York Times, let's go to the New York Times article. Then he said, well, make sure you use Bell Labs name on this all the time. <laughs> right. So that was the fun part about this. First, the first reaction was, get that out of here. Take it to my rec room, my home room. <laughs> Not, don't leave it here. It's so many people seeing it. But instead of that, it, became, <laughs> it appeared very soon after that, it appeared in the New York Times. Art and uh, read the title there. The art and science proclaim alliance in, with in avant-garde. Uh, what was the word there? I didn't see it. Okay. Okay, so we'll move on. Uh, you've talked about this before, but a little bit about your background. But the interesting thing is, in 1964, with the Bellflix program that you created, can you talk a little bit about Bellflix? When uh, that we call it, I call it B-Flex, B-E, for Bell Labs. That was a uh, program specifically for making movies, good diagrammatic, largely diagrammatic new movies that were specifiable by, uh, by uh, instructions to the computer. Um, so that was a kind of a interesting you know something interesting and but, but at that time all all video and all video was analog right on on uh, on film and this was the beginning of digitizing film yes, the, the, there was output there was fairly early in the in the uh, early 60s that there were um, there was a machine that produced any picture that you could describe and have written on tape by a pro, some kind of program, and uh, I had developed several tricks, if you want to call it that, for making visual images that were printed by this new machine, and, and, uh, and that, that uh, that's a particularly you know that, that there, were, there were scientific uses for that, mathematical demonstrations and whatnot, and and in fact you could make any picture. Produce what with this uh, microfilm printer, you could produce any any picture that you can have that you can describe by a mathematical program about how bright every single spot in the picture is, line after line, dot after dot, and uh, in each line, how bright should that image be? In other words, the image is composed of many many lines of many many pixels that are uh, this is at some point between white and black, and, and by having the right numbers for the brightness of the image at each one of those pixels, we call them picture cells, uh, you can produce any image that you care to define by, by a program. Now, this image may be, be produced by, uh, may, may be guided by, uh, uh, an image that has been that was, uh, on a photographic plate, say, or something that, that can be um, <clears throat> digitized, and, and that is to say, turned into numbers, indicated you know, from zero to nine, let's say, and saying how bright that image should be. And then I wrote a program, or somebody wrote a program that defined, that turns that number into a little figure that is mostly black or uh, shaded up to almost completely white, uh, all mechanical, not very interesting, but somewhat new in, in, the, in the world. Ken, why don't you talk about why you were hired at Bell Labs in the first place? What, what was, uh, from what I remember you telling me at that time, uh, you, you were your job was really about visual images and, and uh, studying the brain, or what was your role at Bell Labs at that time? I was... Uh, I landed in a group of uh, programmers who were defining, developing ways of using computers. And in particular, there were maybe half a dozen people or maybe even more who were uh, involved in producing output in terms of visual images of pictures, so to speak, rather than just numbers. Um, I, I had just bounced out of uh, MIT with my PhD and uh, 
and they gobbled me up and that was, <laughs> it was turned out to be quite a playground. Um, playing with the new machinery, doing new things in new ways. And, uh, and uh, I was fairly free to define my own job, uh, having done something that was sort of interesting. Uh, I did other things that turned out to be somewhat interesting. And uh, so for me, it was a playground that I was play, uh, paid for, 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 uh, for playing. So I, I'm going to jump in here. Um, you know, I, I love that you use the word playground. Um, I see your work as being playful, but seriously playful, that you took your play quite seriously. Um, and how it sounds like Bell Labs was quite supportive of that, not just with you, but with, you know, many people there. Um, could you say a little bit more about how they managed to en encourage you and support you and, and your colleagues there to do your serious play? I don't think there was a, a policy enunciated, printed anywhere. Um, I did things that were fun. Uh, it got some, uh, they were somewhat newsworthy at times. They were certainly fun for me. And uh, I tried to, to find out, I experimented to find out what the, uh, what the perimeters were of the acceptable things to, to work on <laughs> and to produce. And I occasionally was uh, slapped a bit on the hand and said, wait, no, no, that you're... <laughs> <laughs> some uh, some really uh, you know talk with the chemists and physicists and electronics people and see if you can't find uh, uh, some uh, better excuses so to speak <laughs> for for the for making images with a computer. Do you remember when you first decided to make mosaics out of dominoes? Um, do you was there like a light bulb moment that? because you're the first to my knowledge who's done uh, this wonderful work. Um, it's been a great inspiration to me. I, I wouldn't be doing the work that I've done over the last 20 years if it wasn't for encountering your own work. So what was the big light bulb moment for you um, with that? There, there, I don't think there's a was a big light bulb moment. I mean, the, uh, well, that nude picture, the, that was uh, it's kind of stunning and uh, and provocative, and uh, it, it was essentially, among other things, it was a test to find out uh, what were the limits, if there were any, about uh, what we can, what we should work on, and that was that was about the limit. I think that was uh, that was on the edge of acceptability. It was uh, certainly popular, and now whether this should be known as having been produced at Bell Labs, that was. The big question, and uh, and should we be encouraged or discouraged to to go on from there in various directions? And if anything, we were slightly discouraged uh, um, because that that was kind of uh, it's, it's not what telephone people, telephone users were imagining that that's what they're paying for. These are some of the things you did at Bell Labs. Uh, this uh, touch screen before touch screen existed. Can you talk about what this is? Uh, you remember this? Yes, this, this is a, uh, uh, kind of a combination of a picture that has buttons on it. And then the buttons uh, are interactive. You push, push a certain button that has a label and it does the thing that you, it's a way of, uh, pushing buttons and instead of pushing the buttons on the screen and smushing up the screen with your finger print and whatnot, it combines the picture on the screen with the picture of buttons and the buttons really don't have any labels themselves except that the image on the screen is superimposed with what you see. And then you, in other words, you, what you see is a semi-transparent hand and they semi-transparent the buttons and then uh, you're pushing buttons that are whose labels change uh, according to where you are and what program. Uh, was this at Bell Labs? Yes this, yes, this was at Bell Labs. And now here's another machine. I can't quite make out what it is, but uh, 
what was this machine? It says a, uh, this was uh, your uh, faculty of the graduate school at Cornell for your, right. what, your, your thesis? Yes, yes. <clears throat> and I don't, uh, I don't see, I modified, just slightly modified an electron microscope to, uh, so that you could see it uh, in, at a, on a fluorescent screen. And I don't even remember with the particular use of this, but uh, it was um, it was a, med, a project in which uh, a an image produced by the electron microscope can, can be modified by looking through the binoculars. It's complicated to say what what it might be used for, but uh, it was it was an interesting uh, application of. Computer graphics, essentially. Okay, let's move on. And this was something with sign language. Yes. I yes. Think this is. And an experiment uh, with the fingertips, re reducing the sign language uh, transmitter in person, doing sign language with uh, photo re reflective uh, spots. And the point here is that um, with the position of the spots can can uh, can be imagined as as a hand with lighted fingertips, uh, which means uh, that by displaying about a dozen spots on the screen, you can uh, the per a person can easily imagine the hu the uh, human hand behind that. And the point there is that. The image, the moving image of these spots is a very compressed form of the image that can be seen as hands doing the sign language. So this uh, it suggests a, a very uh, limited channel for communication of anything that can be represented as sign language because you, you see the hand, so to speak doing all of the sign language emotions and, and figures. Okay. Uh, and who was this uh, picture of? Uh, who worked with me, that's, uh, that's stand in front of the dome. He has a beautiful, had a beautiful semi-spherical dome, which on uh, which he projected uh, any combination you can imagine. That. And, uh, including produce, computer produced images, you see him on this far right here, where he, we're looking at an, at an image that is gonna be used later for his, for one of his shows in this, in this dome. Okay, uh, here's a, we get to the domino pictures. Who's this person? Uh, Makovu. Mm-hmm. And uh, involved in computer, uh, we're writing and, and reporting about computer images and whatnot. Uh, and it's an image of his, of uh, Carl, made with, I believe it is six complete sets of uh, double nine dominoes. Right. So that, to me, that's the most amazing thing about Ken is that Ken loves restrictions. Now, today, there's many pictures on the computer that you can see of uh, anybody can make a mosaic with jelly beans or Lego blocks. If you get to pick and choose the ones that you want to use, you know, anybody uh, and, and if you especially if you make it very big, of course, you can make a picture. But Ken loves the restrictions. And that's what the dominoes are. And and all of his work is trying to get a recognizable images with the with this a complete set and with these restrictions which is amazing to me in this case i think it was six that, sets of, of double nine domino so you're using not you know not just picking and choosing the good pieces and the bad pieces getting rid of that's like right. I think anybody could do that but that's what you're really to me you're is really genius we'll get to that later i, I agree with that completely Go ahead, robert talk about yeah. that yeah, well, I'm just uh, going to read a quote that I found of, of Ken's. Um, this is a quote from this wonderful book uh, that has a chapter on Ken. Um, this book is called Masters of Deception. It's edited by 
It was edited by Al Seckel, and it's you know a phenomenal volume. It includes uh, chapters on great <laughs> artists like Ken and Archimbaldo from you know, hundreds of years ago, and many others. I encourage anyone who hasn't encountered this to get this. Um, and the quote that I'm going to read comes from the chapter on Ken. And Ken wrote, I want to create visual ambiguity, something that demonstrates that recognizable images, especially faces, arguably the most fast, uniformly fascinating of all subject material, can be made while observing them under severe or unusual constraints. In spite of such constraints, we are successful at giving meaning to what we see, particularly when recognizing faces. My greatest fun comes from using odd building blocks, and I think many would consider dominoes to be an odd building block, uh, which uh, with their own severe constraints, Mark mentioned using complete sets of double nine, um, so that results can be properly evaluated. Um, and I think Mark's gonna show more examples of Ken's mm. artwork, which uses these quote unquote odd building blocks, odd, odd and wonderful, truly wonderful building blocks. So if you could share again, Mark, and Right. talk about the, or show some of the additional images. Yeah, here, no, okay, here, uh, Ken, that's the famous uh, spool man, uh, the thread man. Um, I, I was, I remember encountering this uh, when you gave a talk, Ken, at uh, Gathering for Gardner, and the story behind this was just incredibly moving to me. So this was a piece for me of mathematically generated, computer generated artwork that took physical form because you actually built it out of spools of thread. But what particularly motivated and moved me was your story of this gentleman, um, Aaron Feuerstein, who was the owner of a fabric mill in Massachusetts. And three of the buildings of this fabric mill were um, damaged, burned down in a fire. And instead of just collecting the insurance money, uh, Feuerstein kept the workers on the payroll uh, kept paying them salary while uh, they rebuilt, it, rebuilt the buildings. Um, so it, it was really moving to me to hear you say that story back at Gathering for Gardner and how, you know, you really brilliantly wedded the, the subject matter, um, Aaron Feuerstein, with the, these odd building blocks, the spools of thread. I, I've, I've marveled at that in you know, really a great deal of your pieces of work, how you match up the, the building blocks with the subject matter. So if you wanna say anything about this particular piece or any of these in general, um, that would be phenomenal for me to hear and for others too, I think. Did I do that? <laughs> I guess I did, yeah. That was so a long time ago. Here is the, again, uh, Robert, you can talk about this, the Solomon Golem piece and- Yeah, Solomon Golem is known to mathematicians uh, for, um, you know, among other things, uh, a, a book um, that was titled uh, pen, uh, Pentominoes. These are uh, figures, geometric figures that are made from joining squares together um, edge to edge fashion. So if you have, um, you know, polyominoes in general, but pentominoes are when you jo join five of them together. Uh, tetrominoes are formed when you join two of them together and they form the basis of the game Tetris. Dominoes are formed by joining two squares together. So I, I love this portrait you did of Solomon Golem, who was a regular at, at Gathering for Gardener out of these uh, mathematical objects, these uh, pentominoes that he studied. And then on the right, you see Samuel Morse, uh, the inventor of the Morse code system, uh, a portrait of Morse done out of Morse, Morse code symbols. Um, and, and there's many more examples of these. They're, they're just delightful. Um, Anybody can go to Ken's uh, website, Knowlton Mosaics. You'll find them on the web and you'll see a gallery of a lot of these pictures. We're just pointing out a few. Go ahead, uh, uh, Robert. You can ask him about this. So, um, you know, as, as an artist myself who works um, in, in a similar way inspired by you, um, I, I'm personally colorblind, so I have a tough time um, is it harder for you with the computer to do color-based work or is grayscale work easier? No, it's, uh, they're <laughs> equally it's easy. Uh, the question is, uh, can you get the right colors uh, if you go to color or is it, uh, uh, would you rather do it in black and white? It's just uh, two, two, two modes of presenting. Uh, a computerized uh, quantified uh, image. 
So rather than using just you know a single grayscale value, use RGB values, a you know a trio of numbers and way of uh, adopting a particular set of constraints that makes it interesting. Uh, if you want to so, do a uh, a finely detailed recognizable picture, uh, as you might see in a book or a newspaper. Uh, you would get a better picture, but uh, it would not be, it would not have that interest or intrigue or whatever. It's, it's from uh, adopting extreme constraints in what you are allowed to yourself, what you have allowed yourself to you to do, use, or adopt. Uh, the, nevertheless, you can produce a recognizable image of a person. Uh, this, that makes it interesting. How crude can it be and yet, yet be interesting and, and recognizable as a specific person who you know or know about? So it seems to me that your preference in many of these is to use, you know, fewer pieces, fewer building blocks, like six sets of dominoes as opposed to a hundred complete sets, or, you know, a re relatively small number of toy cars rather than just an immense collection of toy cars. You like the visual ambiguity of, you know. And, and the struggle. Uh -huh. I mean, pose for yourself, pose severe constraints, like exactly all of the dominoes, so many sets and six sets, uh, uh, and you work harder. And if, if you produce a recognizable image of a particular person, then you have learned something about uh, how hard you have to work in terms of how severe the constraints are for the, for the, uh, for the pieces of the picture. I have, a, I have a question that comes from the chat from Frank Ferris. Um, Frank is interested in you know, the artistic choices you make. I imagine at some point when you're using your software to create a mosaic, let's say out of toy cars, um, it must have been the case at least at some points where you would look at the output from your computer software and then you would take a look at it and you'd say, well, you know, I don't really like that. Um, so could you say about how you as kind of was well, the artist guiding and being supplemented by the computer, how that all worked and how your artistic choices as a human being um, were really, you know, played a fundamental role in the creation of this artwork? Well, we can consider toy cars as, as the output of the pieces, the, the mosaic tiles on the picture. Um, if, if I, the obvious thing to do is to do it at various resolutions. Use uh, uh, 50 cars or 100 or 300 or 600. And before playing, wiring down or gluing or whatever, uh, the pieces you, you produce a picture of what it would look approximately what it would look like if you sacrificed uh, 600 cars or for the purpose. Uh, so you, you, it's, it's a matter of trial and error. What, what would it look like if I used so many images, you know, one by two essentially uh, areas co covered with approximately this number of, of uh, colors? Uh, so the, their step is uh, of, uh, playing coarser or finer. And then the point is to get something that is coarse enough to make it uh, easier to make. And for one thing, you have to wire down fewer cars, um, but uh, it's also coarser as an overall image. Now, where do, where do you find it? Um, where do you find the result kind of intriguing in the sense of, my gosh, that's little cars there. Uh, and, uh, and yet, uh, if you back away far enough, it's actually a portrait. Now, how does, how does your vision work such that from far away, you recognize this as not only as a face, but a particular person's face. Mm -hmm. And then when you get up close, the person disappears, the, the, the identity of the person. And then and finally, if you're very close, even that it's a face of a person, you, you don't see it. It's, it the, uh, it's the um, curious situation where the closer you get, the less you see of, of, of the overall picture. Right. 
Okay, let's show a few more images. Doug McKenna, who's on this call. Robert, maybe you want to talk a little bit about this. And, and Doug might be able to say something too, if, if he's okay. able. Um, so this is one of my favorites. Doug's a friend of mine, and I love Doug's work on space filling curves. And I imagine that, uh, Ken, you must have run into Doug at a gathering for Gardner and decided to make this portrait of Doug out of these uh, space filling curves uh, that he studied and continues to study. Right. This is a single line. It starts on the lower, uh, the lower left corner and it ends up at uh, the lower right corner. And it is a single line that connects all the way through the picture, uh, tightly crowded in some places to make a whitish area and some some areas that uh, have very little in each square that gives a, an image of uh, an area of the image that is dark. So it's a way of turning a grayscale picture into a uh, variously crowded or, or sparsely filling the, uh, the local, local area. So Robert, why don't you talk about that a little bit because this is an area where you, which is now I guess it's, it's a a TSP art, would you want to talk a bit? Because that, that's your specialty where you've created a lot of beautiful pictures, Robert. Well, you know, what I, I would rather focus on Ken, but um, certainly uh, the, you know, the, evolution the of similarity that. between what I do in traveling salesperson art. Well, why don't you explain um, to people what that is? What is the traveling sales? What is TSP art, for example? Because it, it um, well, you, you take a, a, a photo and you uh, represent it first as a collection of dots. Um, you do a stipple pattern, um, you know, basically you create a point set that looks like the image. And then you view that collection of points as a collection of cities that must be visited by a traveling salesperson. And then you use a TSP solver to find the best route through all those dots. So it, it is, it produces a, um, in TSP art, a closed curve that ends right where it starts. Uh, but it is a continuous line, just in the same way that these uh, space felling curves are continuous line drawings. Um, it's just closed rather than open. Um, but you have the same sort of uh, features that Ken described um, in sections where, you know, you, you know, you have certain sections where there's a lot of activity, a lot of points, a lot of line segments, and other sections where there aren't so many. Um, and, you know, I found it enormously engaging. Um, you know, I don't know if Doug is wants to say anything. Um, I think Doug is able to. Um. Well, sure. Um, when I came to the first or second G4 back in the early 2000s, randomly, I ended up at a dinner sitting next to Ken and we started talking and I told him that I was studying space flying curves and had discovered some interesting ones. And so he was really interested because he'd always thought about doing this kind of a portrait. So we worked together and the first thing, of course, I, I had to get a picture of myself that was black and white and my, my friend Jeff Raskin, who was the creator of the Macintosh project at Apple, took that photo and I gave it to Ken, he digitized it. And then I, we, the, the first idea I believe, Ken, was you were going to use one of the curves that I had described, but it wasn't optimal for what you wanted. So we used a variation or you used a variation and uh, and then and then you you ran with it from there is what I recall. Anyway, I uh, I, I consider myself completely honored to have uh, received a, a portrait on this, but it was a lot of fun working with you. It's a beautiful work. It also looks a little bit like uh, George Lucas too. I must say, <laughs> <laughs> I've been told that, but uh, in any case, it's not true. <laughs> Okay, we'll move on. Thank you. Uh, this this piece is uh, really interesting to me because uh, it's titled, uh, This is Not a Teapot. Uh, Ken, can you talk about This is Not a Teapot? <laughs> no, no, the, the title is This is Not. No. Yeah, this, oh, not, not a Teapot. Okay, that's why I need you to talk about it because I, one of those optical illusions where I read over. This is, this is a photo of a teapot in very bad condition. <laughs> we took a picture of a teapot, smashed it into hundreds of pieces, 
and rearranged the pieces to make it look as closely as it as I could manage to look like the image of the original teapot. So it is a teapot. It is not not a teapot. It is a teapot in rather smushed up. Condition. So it's a little bit of an homage to Duchamp uh, based on his picture? Or what? Oh, wait, which, which picture? Uh, not, not a teapot, or was that Matisse who said this? Agreed. This, this is not a pipe, Magritte. Right, right, Magritte, right, right. Okay, I'm forgetting my artist here. So, oh. no, this is this is a teapot, actually. Yeah, this is a teapot. Okay. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. There is Ken, a genius at work. Uh, here is this the seashell. Get into some of your seashell pieces, and uh, you can see in the corner there's this piece here. I recorded Ken talking about this a bit, so just just show you a little okay, bit. Okay, ready? Go. <clears throat> this is a picture of Uncle Sam. Um, if you look at it from far enough away, I think you'll be able to verify that. It's um, made of something like uh, 1,380 seashells done in a sort of pixelated way. They're simply in rows and columns. The computer helped me figure out um, how bright the shells should be for a certain pixel of the picture. And, when did you uh, do it? I did this in 1991. I did a bunch of them, just uh, substituting seashells as, as pixels. The seashells themselves were sorted uh, very painstakingly in this instance by putting them one by one under a light meter and deciding uh, which of about a dozen bins to put it in. After that, I've developed other, other ways of uh, dividing the picture into other than tiny squares. And when I'm, when the computer is finished, it prints out a chart showing what to put where. It's a black chart with little white indications on it to, as to which brightness of seashell I should put on each square. And um, I lay it out completely on the black paper where the seashells hide the little white designator. And I look at it from far away and I can, in fact, I can see it from far away as I have my hand in the picture, pointing to a certain seashell and saying to myself, I think that one should be a little darker. Or the white of the eye right up here needs to be a little bit brighter or dimmer than the other side of the pupil over there and so forth. I can, I can see it from far away in two mirrors. So I can, I'm viewing it from about 15 feet away while I have my hands on it. The amusing thing about uh, shows in the park where I put these things up, um, people almost invariably say, what do you do? You put a seashell on the picture and then you run way back and look at it and come up and change it or glue it. And um, they, don't, they don't realize that uh, it's been a trick for a long time for artists to use mirrors to, think, to see a distant view of what they're painting right now. In fact, there's one painting, famous painting by Norman Rockwell, where he is looking at two such mirrors, and the mirrors themselves are in the picture that he's painting. Did you use this exact setup of mirrors uh, to when you made this one, or is this a new table? This is a new, a new table. But you use the same setup? The same, the same idea, yes. Mm -hmm. This is one that uh, <laughs> I, I mounted the mirror on a table. That I used to have it on the ceiling where we first lived, but that was a little awkward. To, to move from one apartment to another. This is, taken up, I can take it apart and I can also move it, you see, I can, uh, I can take the pieces apart and reassemble it if we ever move to another apartment without, uh, without having to screw something onto the ceiling there. Was there something surprising when you made the uh, Uncle Sam picture? You said it was the second seashell picture you made? I think it was, yes. The, but I think you like the part about the star. About the what? The star on his head. Oh, the, the star. I, I love the star. Yes, if you're up close to the star, you don't see hardly anything. You see a, an area, an area here that has some white seashells in it, uh, lighter maybe from far away that might look like some sort of a white blob. 
But when you're far away from it, you see it's a star, it's a five-pointed star, my gosh. And, and, uh, and where does that star come from? That's, that's the thing I, I, I find is so interesting and delightful. This is probably, of all the pictures I've made, this is the one that has the greatest difference, which is really what I'm after. The greatest difference between what, what you see close up and what you see from far away. And not only do I use the mirrors, but I can, I can use this uh, reducing lens. People have tried, they've gone home and taken a magnifying glass and, and it doesn't seem to work. And that's because this isn't a magnifying glass, it's exactly the opposite. It's a negative lens, thinner in the center than the uh, edges. And if you look at things from far away through this, you can uh, see something uh, reduced about um, three times. It's only about a third the size, depending on how far away you are from the lens. So I can really get a, a, a distant view here. Okay, great. Thank you, Ken. Okay. So I just have a couple of questions uh, based on that uh, amazing video. Um, it looks like with the seashell work, um, you you described it really, really well for me. You answered some of my questions um, just by me watching the video. You know, you put these shells under a light meter. Um, the light meter positioned at a certain point, so you're able to divide your big collection of shells into the light shells and the not so light shells and the darker shells. Um, then would, for these seashell images, would you use software to then decide where them, they go? And then as a final step, you know, use your eye to, to make adjustments? Well, one, one question was, um, you know, did you use software with the seashells and then use your eye to, to follow up? And I guess the second related question, Ken, would, um, you know, your software, does it, did it make an attempt to find the absolute provably best way to arrange the the seashells or did it, you know, was it based on more of a heuristic where you're trying to find something that looked really quite good, but it didn't matter if it was provably optimal? I don't remember the ex exact feeling or uh, exact method in that, in that particular picture. Um, sure. The, the, the first thing to do is to put the, get the right amount of light reflected from a white light. Mm -hmm. for, for a particular area and uh, different uh, images, different uh, works, artworks were made in slightly different ways. In some of them, the image was simply marked off in, in rows and columns of pixels, so to speak, uh, as, as you can see in the background of your own image right now on the screen. That's rows and columns of little squares, yes. And, uh, otherwise, uh, uh, sometimes it's a freer form that's more difficult because uh, you have a lot of work to do, but uh, it can you can make a better picture because the, the, the differentiation, if, if the lines between, the, the contour lines, so to speak, of, uh, between light and dark, go, go uh, and eat more precisely along the, the contour deviations and whatever the contour lines of the overall picture, that's, that's harder to work with because uh, each, sec each seashell will represent a non-rectangular, non-square part of the picture, uh, but you will be able to better approximate the intended uh, effect because uh, the lines between say very dark and very light areas will meander as a contour line would in the, in the image and uh, you can get a better image uh, with a lot more work by having uh, the lines the, the, uh, the severe slopes of the lines, so to speak, uh, follow better a contour, uh, contour map of the overall picture. So it depends on how, how much you, you want to work and how good an image you want to make with how few a set of seashells. And um, it, it, it suggests several kinds of 
approximation to the image, the, the black and white fine resolution image that you're trying to approximate. Well, your work is beautiful. Um, and it's clear in hearing you talk about it that um, you're using you know, your artistic side and your math, computer science, engineering side equally, you know, shifting back and forth uh, from one to the other as needed. Um, it's just so, so impressive and inspirational. Well, here we have uh, Domino's, uh, the American Gothic uh, uh, faces uh, with Domino's, but then later here we are as uh, puzzles. And what's amazing is as you get up close, as Ken talked about, you can't really see an image, but your brain or somehow fills in the detail the further back you get. Here's the picture. Uh, that was a precursor of a project that I worked on with Ken, uh, which was the Gigazzo puzzle. And I saw Ken's lecture back in about 2008. And uh, I'd seen it several times, but it occurred to me, maybe we can make a commercial product, a jigsaw puzzle. So I asked Ken, is it possible to make a puzzle uh, that anybody's face could be used? So I'll just play this little video because it Imagine explains that it was an early- to create any picture with the same 300 pieces. Each one of these was made from the same set of pieces. How does it work? Use any picture you want. Send it to the website and you'll get back a symbol grid they call picture DNA. The pieces have symbols on the back. Match the symbols to the grid. Here's a picture of Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> Take them apart and build the picture we took with our mobile phone. You can glue it together and save it or take it apart and build a new picture. So it was first introduced in 2009 in Tokyo at the Tokyo Toy Fair. It was produced by a company called Tenyo, which is famous for making magic tricks. And that was, and it got a lot of press. It was really, it was one of the first really products that used a, a digital and a physical product. It was the first probably. Uh, and it was a big hit in the store. Here you see it on the right. There are pictures on the top. That's the actual to a toy store in Tokyo. And they made faces of all their employees. The, they made three versions, a sepia version, a blue version, and a, uh, the maroon version of the Gigazzo puzzle. And it was a big hit. That was, then Hasbro did it later, the same pieces. Now, the amazing thing is when you think about how can 300 pieces make anybody's face? You know, it just seems like, well, actually, any one of those pieces could be moved in any one of four directions when they're placed down. And well, it, it got an award at Trendy Magazine. So here, this is the interesting part that most people you know, don't really understand math. So the actual number of different combinations of 300 pieces is this number here, one all the way down to here. And uh, Ken had asked Neil Sloan, who all, who's, who's also an attendee of uh, the Gathering for Gardner to run the numbers and do the math of what the, how many different possible combinations there are for the 300 pieces. Each piece could be moved in any one of four directions. And that's how people, uh, that's why you could make anybody's face. Uh, but still, when you explain that to people, it still seems it's hard to comprehend that. You just think, well, it's still 300 pieces. How can anybody's face in the whole world just be made by only 300 pieces, which is kind of like a magic effect. Uh, here is, I don't know how far back this goes. Is this your office, Ken, this picture? Can you see? All the members, maybe a dozen people in a, one department use this, this setup. So this was at Bell Labs and you only had this one set up and many people had to use it. Yes. Right. Okay, so one of the, one of the uh, really <laughs> ironic things about working with Ken on Gigazzo, this is in 2008, 2009. This is the computer that Ken was working with, which wasn't, and uh, he didn't really, wasn't able to play videos and he was working with uh, what the, you know, younger people today would consider an archaic antique uh, computer setup. And I found it just so ironic that we had actually had to uh, get uh, some younger people to help Ken. We got him a new Mac and had to, these young people had to teach Ken, who was like this great pioneer 
and genius with computers, but uh, to, uh, you know, because he couldn't play video. Well, it's not that Ken couldn't play it. The equipment that he had wasn't up to uh, what, what was needed at the time. And so that was the, uh, the time at uh, working on Chicago. Can you talk about a little bit about early years of, at Bell Labs, how slow computers were and how, uh, how uh, and what maybe what you were working with here, what was your system here in 2008? Early on, it was um, a program, so submitting a program expressed and uh, punched, punched out on, uh, on cards, punch cards, and you'd submit that over the counter in line with dozens of other programs. And uh, later in the day or the next, the next morning, you would uh, get the result back. And uh, what happened was that there was a grammatical error in one of your lines of code. And so you fixed that and resubmitted it and got the, the, the uh, better the, the result that afternoon or the next day and uh, discovered that uh, you had made a conceptual error in expressing in, in pro programming logic uh, what you were intending to do. And uh, it was a very slow compared with the things that you can do today, a uh, very slow process. It would take uh, a week's work of, to get one program running uh, and discover that uh, there's a serious conceptual error in, uh, in, in something or other about how you did that. And again, it, it could take two weeks to get one program adjusted right with all of its appropriate uh, coefficients and whatnot. And so uh, it would be a terrible thing to go back to the speed and the awkwardness of uh, in today's view of things. Um, but it was the best that there was available at the time. Uh, these were the different versions of Jagazo. There was uh, the original 300 piece on the top and these different versions, let's go through. Mm -hmm. So after the initial launch of Jagazo, it was very successful. So we had to come up with different variations. And Ken had made this picture, which is uh, a, with the jigsaw puzzle, uh, with a Kincaid picture, which is to the left. And what Ken had done was he bought one of those puzzles and he took every one of the pieces in that puzzle that he bought from the toy store and he used it to make that portrait of Kincaid on the right, which is uh, using every single piece of the same of the, that image to the left. So I said to Ken, is it possible that maybe we can make a puzzle without the spaces in between? Can you make it so that everything is all connected together and, and that way we can have another product, a follow-up product for Jigazo using a picture? So I gave Ken a bunch of pictures. These are the pictures that I gave him to test with. And he said, let me see. He didn't even know if it was possible. He had to play with it and try it. So we, he took this bowl of fruit and these on, on the right are the target images that he used. So he broke up that bowl of fruit on the left and it actually made all of these faces. And in fact, that bowl of fruit chopped up into those pieces can make anybody's face in the whole world, which is absolutely amazing to think about that, you know. So, uh, and then that that later became the Jigazo art, what we call, which, so the Mona Lisa, it uses 520 pieces, uh, can actually be rearranged, that, that piece, that puzzle of Mona Lisa could be arranged to make all those faces there, plus your face or my face or anybody's face. That's the, and uh, there was the, the Munch painting, and this was, marketed only in Japan. Uh, uh, here is a Disney version where it took that Disney picture of Mickey with that little hat on. And with that, the, you can make anybody's face, including other Disney characters. This was a, co a, a color version of Jigazo. So it's actually not color. The interesting thing is the, the original 300 piece Jigazo was just sepia pieces, sepia or the, the maroon pieces or the blue pieces. And people were asking, what can you do color? Can you do color? So the amazing thing is that, well, Ken did produce this set of pieces. I think this is 520 pieces also. But if you look at the faces on the bottom that it makes, you get the impression that they're colored, but those pieces are not strategically placed in the place that you would need the flesh for the flesh tone or the black for the black. It just, it somehow magically it appears and it gives you the impression of a colored picture, which is like, and again, to me, it's real magic. I'm a magician, so I love magic. These are amazing. 
I'm comfortable describing it as magic too, even though I'm not a magician. It's, it's certainly something to marvel at. I think we're getting to the point where we're an hour in and- um, All right, so let's stop sharing and let's- uh... Yeah, if, if people wanna type in some questions into the chat or um, you know, I can relay them, I'd be happy to do that. I, you know, I personally could listen to Ken and right. see his work you know, all day long. Um, it's just so amazing, so wonderful. It's well, just, let, me, let me confess that uh, the answer to many of the questions is uh, simply that it is magic. What's it? <laughs> <laughs> well, math and computer science enable you to uh, pull off magic, right? You know, you're leveraging our incredible brain and human visual system. Um, but yes. I have a question. Go ahead, Doug. Uh, Ken, what in what what is what is it in your experiences that uh, make you into a visual person, a person fascinated by the way things look? Uh, that's my first question, and, and the second question is: Are you a musician? Because I see a piano in the back in the background. I'm somewhat of a pianist. And uh, if we had time, I would demonstrate that, but um, it's, it's not a sensation. I'm this visually conscious person. I, I don't know, possibly because I had parents who were very patient and, uh, and helpful when I would ask, when I would point to something and say, what is this? And I would be pointing to up in the sky or to the ground or to a mountain or to something. And, and they were just, my parents were infinitely patient and helpful and in explaining, explaining to me what the world was and uh, how, it got that, that, how it got that there uh, to, to the extent that they knew and what would happen to it to the, to the extent that they could guess. They were very, very helpful in introducing me to the world and the world to me. And that's, that's the only thing I can say. I, I had a good, a good upbringing in a country school with uh, perhaps uh, 15 students in uh, six grades, uh, all under one teacher for the first uh, four or five years, I think. And finally I got to the school downtown where all of the people in the room were in seventh grade uh, geography or eighth grade arithmetic or whatever. And that was kind of an unusual situation. Anyway, I had a, a very helpful uh, introduction to the world from helpful parents and fortunate schools and colleges and, uh, and that's, that's, that's where I ended up here. Uh, Ken, I wanna just share with you some of the comments from the chat. You know, there's a comment, mind blowing, incredible work, impressive. Um, it really is magic, so exciting, um, amazing talk, things like that. Um, People have loved this. Um, I have loved this, but the people who've attended have loved this. Um, I'm not trying to cut things short, but I wanted you to know that because I know when you're answering questions, it's not really feasible to try and look at the chat at the same time. So I just wanted to know you to know how uh, it appreciated you are and uh, how grateful we all are for you sharing uh, your thoughts with us today. Well, uh, and again, I'm not trying to cut this short, but. Well, well, one thing that you don't see is all of the playing and experimenting and, and uh, oh, shucks, you know, uh, that's the, the wrong turns that uh, after a lot of experimenting and fussing and fuming and uh, backing away, uh, you, you don't see that because uh, things get it's discarded in some of the branches. So there's a lot of experimentation in this. How many rows and columns of those things do you need? Uh, can you get away with only uh, uh, a thousand seashells or do you need 5,000? And, and uh, you don't see a lot of that. There are a lot of that. 
And one, one fortunate thing about working with computers is you don't have to build physically, glue together all of these things that were the wrong turn, taken the wrong turn or the wrong coefficient in the comparison or whatever. Uh, you, you can do a lot of the experimentation on the screen and, and, and back away and do another one. And finally, you get one that looks pretty good. And then you paste down dominoes or seashells or, or whatever. Uh, so the, 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 the computer is a good way of experimenting uh, and discovering uh, bad turns or, or bad experiments or bad sets of coefficients or whatever. And you don't have to build each of these things that ended up bad. You just get a, an approximate view of, ahead of time and say, no, not that. I need more or I, need, I don't need as many or, or whatever. Because uh, the, the, uh, the trials uh, are, are cheap. You don't have to paint uh, a dozen or two dozen images and then pick just one of them. You can see a dozen or two dozen uh, things of what it would look like if you use dominoes. And then you can uh, save a lot of time and uh, expense by seeing an approximation of, of uh, a dozen or two dozen wrong ways of doing it before you center on something that you actually want to build. Uh, I just have a follow-up question. Um, did you ever have an, an experience where you thought you had programmed what you wanted to program and you take a look at it and you realize you made a mistake, but the mistake was beautiful and interesting and pushed you in a different direction? Uh, yes and no. Um, every picture that I actually made with uh, some dozens of hours sometimes uh, gluing things together according to a chart, uh, every, every one of those projects was a learning experience. Now, that doesn't mean I throw the thing away at the end. I, I realize I need more delicate uh, differentiation uh, for the face part of, a, of an image uh, or, or whatever. I, I, I should lighten the whole thing, uh, except using this, the, the same black for the black end, the same white for the white end, but shift the whole image uh, uh, to get more differentiation in the face part of the image, and, and regardless of what that does to the background. So it, everything, every one of those things is a learning experience, and it's hard to say what was learned. I mean, a lot of this is becomes sort of second nature in your planning or working at one or another stage of the process. And it's hard to, hard to spell that out. Or it's, if anything, uh, the, the best I can say is that looking at a new result in a completely different way, a new way of processing a picture, I look at it and I say something about, I should ignore the background and pay a lot more attention to the foreground or mm -hmm. something like that. And, and the only way of really having that clunked over your head is to, to, to make the mistake, so to speak, and do it again or, or, or do it in the same kind of process, but with a new, a new picture, a new target picture. It's all, everything you're doing and in some, some of these things is, is a learning experience. Or, or, or yeah, it, it's, a, it's an experiment. Every every one of those images really is a result of an experiment, is ex, result of an experiment, so to speak, a complicated experiment, and the the, the ones that go to to finality, to a final pasted down mosaic part 
pieces, um, every one of those things is an experiment that ends up not quite as good as it would have been if only I had such and such. Then sometimes I redo the whole thing and change that such and such, or sometimes I just leave it and say, you know, that's no nobody. Uh, it's not worth the trouble to to redo the whole picture just to to fix up a little bit and, uh, of the difference between the background part of the picture and the foreground. So it, it's it's always an experiment. But that's probably with, with all artists, I would think. If the thing is finished, but then you say, you probably say, and I, I'm, I'm guessing that artists feel this many more times than they, than they admit or express uh, that uh, I, you know, I should have, in, you know, instead I should have something or other about the background sky or whatever. Um, but, uh, very seldom have I seen final pictures uh, um, analyzed by the artist as, as failure to do it quite right in this or that uh, respect. So, but that's art, I think. I, am, I imagine, I certainly imagine that every artist will look at his or her own final product, what you see as a final product, because it wasn't after that any, you know, no, no hot touch up was done. Uh, I would guess that every artist or almost every artist will look at a final picture, what you see as the final picture. And, and then the artist himself or herself says, I should have done a little bit differently with the rays of sun from behind that cloud. I'm, I'm guessing. I'm, I'm, I certainly would be my, that is my response to my own artwork. Yes, I should have, but I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> Even if I'm going to do the methods somewhat differently, I will certainly do it with a different subject as the main figure in the, in the picture. This, this has been uh, this has been an absolute treat, and um, thank you very much, Ken and Mark and Bob. And uh, before we wrap up, do we have any any final questions? Uh, here's a question: How do you decide when to stop? <laughs> I'm I'm tired of fussing. <laughs> Because it's not even even though I see things that I that are a little bit wrong, I fix that. But in in doing so, create a different problem. Maybe I don't know. I I I, I changed something. It didn't didn't seem to get worse. But I don't know whether it got better or not. Uh, I'm going to glue them anyway. Where they are now just loosely placed. Um, there's no general answer to, to know when to stop. There's, you look at it and there's something, if there's something obviously wrong, especially with an eye, uh, then, then that's really got to be fixed. No matter what exchange of pieces I end up using, I've got to fix that left eye. Uh, on the other hand, if the face is pretty good, it doesn't matter that you've lost a, a sense of uh, something in the background. Uh, it, uh, there's no general answer. You, you, you see something that, is, that looks wrong in, a, as in, in, a, in an important part of the picture, and you've got to fix that somehow. And by exchanging pieces or doing something, or, the, um, or shifting the boundary between a dark piece and a light piece, and just moving a little bit more to the right or the left or up or down, um, it depends on the picture and what looks to be wrong and what seems to be fixable. Um, there's no general answer. You have you look at something and you 
sense that some adjustment has to be done with the nose or one or the other, whatever. Um, and if you don't fix it, you're going to be unhappy about that because later everything is all finished and even, even in an art show somewhere and you realize, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't notice that odd looking ear pointing out and <laughs> awkwardly. Um, there's no general answer to any of these things. You, you do what, what an artist does, I assume. You, you look at it for a while and, and if it's fixable without a lot of trouble, uh, fix it. You know, it's, uh, otherwise you go on. Okay, thank you. Well, on that note, deciding when to stop, maybe we are at a good place. I don't see any more questions in the chat. So thank you everyone for joining us for this uh, first in our ongoing monthly series of Celebration of Mind Talks. And I uh, hope to see you again in another month. And thank you once again to all of our panelists. Bye-bye.